Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Now, 1 Samuel 16 introduces a, a new person into the history of Israel. This is a person whose destiny goes all the way back to Genesis 49.10, even to Genesis 3.15. This is the person to whom Jesus will be most associated with, the most earthly person whom Jesus will be most associated with. He was alluded to in chapter 13 when Samuel told Saul that the Lord was looking for a man after his own heart. And that, of course, wasn't Saul. And today, we are being introduced to the young man, David, the son of Jesse of Bethlehem. And so verse 1 starts off with the situation or the setting. And the first word, now, says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, And remember, it was only chapter 15, only a couple of verses before this, that Samuel is executing judgment on King Agag, and only a few verses before that where Samuel had pronounced God's judgment upon Saul so that Saul was now done. He may still be the king, but the spirit has departed from Saul, and the Lord is moving on to the next person who's actually going to be the Lord's king. In fact, you see that here in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? And there we just see that Samuel himself was just cut to his heart and just so grievous of, of Saul's rebellion and how Saul was doing all of this for himself. He was really just in it for himself. And so Samuel's grieved. The Lord goes on to say, Since I have rejected him from being king of Israel, fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king, listen to this, for myself among his sons. And that's a key point there. Because when the Lord chose Saul, he chose Saul because Saul fit the expectations of the people. They wanted this grand king like uh, the Amalekites or the Philistines had. And the Lord is saying, oh, you want that? Here's what it is. And how is that working out for you? Well, we know it doesn't work out very well. Saul's character was greatly lacking. And so now, now that we got that out of the way, it's now time to choose the right king. And so the Lord tells Samuel in verse 1, Go to Bethlehem. I've got a king there. He's going to be of the sons of Jesse the Bethlehemite. And so when Samuel hears that he's supposed to go to Bethlehem, he's like, I don't think that's the greatest idea. If Saul hears about me going there, he's going to kill me. Now that might just mean that either Saul would figure something was up, or maybe Saul was bitter at Samuel too. Maybe Saul heard Samuel's message. And since Saul is giving evidence that he doesn't really believe that Samuel or the Lord, any of that's really true, like he really needs to take it seriously. Maybe when Samuel pronounces this judgment upon Saul, he's like, you know what? I just don't like you. Uh, Get out of here. Get out of my way. I'm going to go do my own thing, be my own king. So either way, Samuel is now afraid of Saul. But the Lord gives him the solution there saying, just go offer a sacrifice to me because they could offer it anywhere until the the temple was built. They could pretty much, wherever Samuel was, was a, a rolling place they could offer a sacrifice. So go offer a sacrifice there, invite the people to be a part of it, and I'll show you who I'm going to have you anoint. Let's talk about anointing for a moment here. This is a, an official ceremony where an official would pour a small measure of oil over a person's head. Now, this wasn't like a, a quart of black motor oil, like, you know, 5W20, like my excursion takes or something like that. This is basically olive oil that's going to fit into a horn. If you were to cut open a horn and, and kind of hollow it out a little bit, clean it out, you could put some oil in there. And this was an ancient ceremony that they would do to to really establish somebody as being set apart for the Lord's work. And so Samuel agrees to go to Bethlehem, and when he arrives, you'll remember from reading this passage, the people in the town are concerned. He explains that he's here to worship the Lord, and he calls them to sanctify themselves. And that's just this idea that a worshiper needs to be pure before the Lord. And, And this was just symbolically represented by washing themselves, washing their clothes, and just being ready to present themselves before this righteous and holy, glorious Lord. So they do this, and since this is a community event here, Jesse comes, and he brings his sons. He leaves one with the sheep, but he brings his sons. And so Samuel sees Eliab in verse 6, and he's like, okay, this is the dude. I mean, look at him. He's great. But the Lord says in verse 7, he gives this great message, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And so the Lord knows what's in Eliab's heart, and he's not the one. Neither was Abinadab nor Shammah. And so Samuel's like, okay, do you have any more kids here? And Jesse's like, well, there is our little guy, but he's out with the sheep. Now, the sheep weren't really that far away. So he says, go get him. And so they, they do, and they bring David before Samuel. 
Turns out David's a good looking chap too. He's got rosy cheeks. He's got beautiful eyes. He's overall a handsome fellow. And the Lord tells Samuel, this is the one. And so, in, in really just probably just stunning shock for everyone, here you've got the youngest of Jesse's sons being brought before Samuel, this, this, this mighty, frightening Samuel. And Samuel then anoints him in front of everyone. And verse 13 says, The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And so now we see that David's been anointed, the Spirit is upon him, and now God is going to begin using David to accomplish his work. So now we've met David. David hasn't said a word yet, but we know he's got this incredibly special destiny. Now, as we go to verse 14, it's almost as if the passage is like, well, meanwhile, in Saul's house, and so the focus shifts to Saul. Verse 14 says that the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit had replaced it. We know from reading the rest of 1 Samuel that Saul was often irrational in his hatred of David. I mean, irrational in the sense that David was completely innocent, and Saul was the perpetrator of the evil. But we can kind of understand the reason. The Lord has told Saul he's rejected him. He knows this. He knows his days are numbered. He knows that his son Jonathan won't ascend the throne. And so when he sees David coming along, he's like, I could see the writing on the wall. And he doesn't like it because he wants his son to be established. He wants his kingdom. I mean, that's where Saul is just about himself and his kingdom, not about the Lord's kingdom. He's not trying to establish a kingdom for God's people to worship the Lord. He's trying to establish his own kingdom. And so David is a threat to that. And so for the rest of Saul's life, he's got this hatred towards David and he's got this evil spirit that's tormenting him. Now, why does God do this? Why not just take Saul out? Why why torment him with this spirit? I believe this spirit came upon Saul both as God's judgment upon him, but also to give Saul an opportunity to repent. I mean, even down in verse 15, Saul's servants can see that what's going on here. They, they recognize that the Lord has sent an evil spirit and it's just kind of tormenting him. And so everyone can see this. But Saul never comes to the point of saying, you know what? I'm sick of being on the wrong side of God. I have displeased him and I need to get right with him. I mean, Saul's never saying, you know what? Even if I'm going to lose the kingdom, I still want God's kingdom established and I'll do whatever I can to join with the work of God and bring him glory. Saul never does that. And so Saul spends the rest of his life essentially aligned with God's spiritual enemies. And this, this, uh, this tormenting spirit is just evidence of that. As we look at this whole event, it's, it's confusing. I'm not going to claim to have all the answers. But it does give us, this whole event gives us insight into God's sovereignty over these matters. The world tries to act as though Satan and his demons are this overwhelming force in, in equal opposition to God and sometimes even more powerful than God. But here we're seeing that that's not the case at all. As hard as it is for us to understand, the Bible consistently presents Satan and his demons as being submitted to God. Now, they may rebel, and they may be, may be perpetrating evil, but they are on a chain. And you see this in passages like Judges 9.23, where the Lord sends an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. Or in 1 Kings 22, verses 19-23, to where the Lord uses a deceiving spirit to misguide Ahab. Or probably most famously, where the Lord allows Satan and Job 1 to test Job's character and prove Job's righteousness. Or just think about all the times that the the demons obeyed Jesus in his earthly ministry. They are submitted to him. And so when we are in a relationship with God, just covered in the righteousness of Christ so that we can abide in fellowship with God, we don't have to fear Satan. 1 John 4, 4 tells us that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And yet if we quench the spirit and follow the teachings of this world, We're really opening ourselves up to the spirit of this world returning to our lives and bringing a gloom and a misery that should lead us to repent and fully submit to the Lord. What Saul needed was for someone to point out to him this whole thing and say, you know what, Saul, you're living for yourself and that's never going to give you the peace and joy you need. It's time to stop being double-minded and give yourselves entirely to the Lord. Maybe somebody said this to Saul, but either way, he never does this, and so he suffers with this spirit for the rest of his life. But in all of this, we can even see how the Lord is sovereign over this situation. Because you see, Saul never submits to the Lord, and so he's always just kind of miserable. And so his staff suggests he gets a musician to play peaceful music. Kind of like, you know, um, the way we like to play music today, just have something calming and soothing. Saul agrees to this, and so they, they go looking for who could this be. And they end up choosing none other than David, the very one who's been anointed by God. So here we're seeing that sometimes God will even use our secondary skills to move us to the place where he wants us to be, where he's going to use our full skills and our full calling. And that's the case with David. 
And so whenever David is with Saul, the evil spirit departs from him. Now, why is this? We don't really know, but I believe that this is a matter of the Holy Spirit coming into Saul's presence. Remember, David is filled with the Holy Spirit, and so when he goes into Saul's presence, he's coming and he's singing songs. And we know from David's psalms that David just loves the Lord. He's praising the Lord. He's just bringing these holy truths into the presence of Saul. And so when when maybe that evil spirit hears this, like, you know what? I'm not going to stay and hear God celebrated, so that spirit departs. Now, we don't know, but I don't think it's the music as so somehow just listening to Pandora or Spotify is going to just calm us. I believe the issue here is more about the, a holy man filled the Holy Spirit bringing God's truth into Saul's presence, and that has that peaceful, calming influence in his life. You know, when it comes to matters of demons, there are whole books written on the topic, and unfortunately, a lot of these books are sensational and and really filled with speculation. If you have any desire to learn more about just the world of demons or understand it more, I would encourage you to read a book by a guy named Alex Kanya, K-O-N-Y-A, Alex Kanya, and the book is just simply called Demons. And like I said, there are so many other books out there that are filled with sensationalism and speculation. Alex Kanye's book is pretty much balanced and straightforward. It's not super exciting, but I think it's fairly accurate in understanding how demons work in this world. Well, as we finish up here, that's our passage today. And there's so many different things we could apply to our life here. But how about this? How about as you just go to the Lord and just spend some time with him, how about reflecting back on your life and seeing God's hand of guidance? He guided David and brought David to his plan. He was even guiding Saul, though Saul was in rebellion to him. How about looking for God's hand of guidance in your life and just stopping and praising him and and worshiping him for the work he has done in your life? This passage also shows us that we serve a God who is not bound into neat little boxes. We we don't fully understand God. He is a God just to be worshipped and revered. And we need to come before him with a heart like David's, a heart that loves God and worships God and serves God and and really just asking God, Lord, give me a heart like David's that I would rightly be walking with you and worshiping you. And finally, if there's any similarities between you and Saul, I mean, in my own heart, I know there often is. And maybe our obedience is half-hearted, or maybe we're only serving just to look good before others. Or maybe our primary goals is really just about us and just trying to serve us and not really serve the Lord. If there is any of this in your heart, bring that to the Lord and confess it. Ask him to be delivered of it so that you would be like David, a man or a woman after God's heart. Well, we're going to end things there. Hope you have a great day and I look forward to seeing tomorrow's read about David and Goliath, one of the most famous events in the entire history of mankind, and just seeing how this fits into the overall work and plan of God in the Word of God. With that, we'll see you tomorrow.